Okay, the variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket. That's what VASMIR stands for. It's actually an acronym, sort of, but it's really just a trademark at this point, and it's a name. So it's, a, it's an electric propulsion uh, engine. Uh, it's, uh, it provides steady state electrical uh, propulsion power. It receives its power from any power source, DC power like a solar array. There's uh, nothing special about it. There's a lot of people say we have to be nuclear. No, we don't. <laughs> we can be solar. Uh, it basically converts gas into a hot plasma jet to produce thrust, and it protects the material surfaces from this hot plasma by using strong magnetic fields. That's one of the unique features in the magnetoplasma part of, of the name. It can use many types of propellants. It can use hydrogen, helium, neon, argon, krypton. It can also use xenon and iodine. We've tested with all these, by the way. Mostly we test with argon. It can use other things too. So it's a, it's a, good, uh, a good type of technology to use if you want to use uh, or produce your propellant at a, at a location that's away from the Earth. And, and so why is it that we need this? I think it's going, there it goes. Okay, sorry this is a little, a little bit cartoonish, but this is, a, this is a slide that Franklin actually did probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. <laughs> a very, very old slide. Maybe not that old, but uh, it explains the difference between electric propulsion and uh, chemical propulsion. In a chemical system, you have your fuel, your kerosene, or your hydrogen, or whatever you're burning, and you have your oxidizer, your, your liquid oxygen, let's say, and hydrogen. You combine those two together in a combustion chamber, and the heat from that reaction is what produces the power and the exhaust that, that, that provides the, the exhaust to give you thrust with this type of rocket. When you switch to an electric rocket, you still get thrust, but instead of using an oxidizer, you don't have to carry that with you anymore. You use solar arrays, for example, here to produce electricity. The electricity is then combined with the propellant to produce very hot gas, so hot that it becomes plasma. And I'll talk about what plasma is in just a few more minutes. But this hotter exhaust makes electric rockets much more fuel efficient, and uh, you get the power for the combustion. Instead of getting it from oxidation, you get the power from electricity. Okay, so chemical rockets are, are great devices. They, they've been worked on for many, many years. They're, they're beautiful technology for getting off the ground, and they have some other uh, uh, special things, too, that we've seen through this, this, this uh, seminar series. But they have serious limitations when you start to go beyond Earth orbit. And uh, if you imagine just a simple picture going in one dimension, you can get a pretty good idea about what the problem is. So if a rocket tries to go faster than the exhaust is expelled out the back, so for instance, this is the, uh, an indicator of the rocket's velocity. This is an indicator of the exhaust coming out of the back of the rocket. If you're an observer standing here in front of, the, of, the, um, of this thing and watching it go by, you will actually see the exhaust plume following the rocket because it's going slower out the back than the rocket's trying to go. This is extremely wasteful. Uh, and the propellant, if, if you can imagine this rocket went out and stopped out here on the right someplace, you can imagine, uh, as you sit there and watch it, this, this exhaust plume will eventually follow you all the way to your destination. So this is just not a good idea to do if you wanted to go really far and really fast. And so the best chemical uh, rocket velocities, uh, they expel this exhaust at about 4,000 meters per second. That would be, for instance, like the space shuttle main engines. The thing is, is that when you're in low Earth orbital uh, low Earth orbit, your orbital velocity is already 8,000 meters per second. You're already going twice as fast as you can spit the, the propellant out the back. And um, so, so already when we're in low Earth orbit, we've reached the point where chemical rockets really require an exponentially increasing amount of fuel to go faster. That is a big problem. Exponentially growing fuel is why you have this gigantic rocket stack that's almost all fuel. We, we've got to solve that problem. So, to go faster after you reach orbit, uh, uh, you need really, really hot exhaust. And so to remain efficient, the exhaust has to come out of the back of the rocket faster than the rocket is trying to go. As long as that's occurring and you're standing here watching the rocket go by, you'll continue to see the exhaust plume move to the left and the rocket moving to the right. It's much more efficient at using a propellant and ultimately allows you to go much faster because the, the ultimate limit is something you know, just a little bit faster than you ex and ex can expel your, your, um, your thrust or your, your, your exhaust plume. So to get this hotter exhaust, 
you can never do that with a chemical rocket. You need to have plasma. And I'll talk about what plasma is in a little bit, but that's exactly what all electric rockets use, is plasma. Okay? So what is plasma? Well, plasma, this, it's sometimes called the fourth state of matter. This is not the plasma in your blood. This is a, a different plasma. And it's, it's basically all the states of matter are determined by how much heat are, uh, is, in the, is in the material. So if you start with um, solid, for instance, this is a cold, cold material. The molecules can't move past each other, and so it has solid properties. You warm it up a little bit, add some heat, and the molecules or atoms begin to slide past one another. You add still more heat, and the, the atoms get spread apart by a, a large distance, and it becomes a gas. If you add even more heat, then the gas becomes so hot that the electrons become free from the atomic forces. So some of the electrons get knocked off of the atoms, and you're left with a, a positively charged, uh, or what used to be an atom, and a free electron. So these electrons move around independently, but they, they still have the opposite charges, and opposite charges still attract. So they can only move so far. A, a plasma, by definition, have en has enough ions and electrons in a, in a unit of volume to prevent any real extensive separation of the charge. This, this is called Debye, a Debye length, if people want to look that up on the internet. Um, and these plasmas also exhibit a collective behavior. It's very important to understand that the plasmas still are glued together in, in a soup that you can't separate very easily. So where do you find plasmas? Uh, plasma was really first studied extensively in the 1920s. We're talking about 100 years ago for vacuum tubes by a guy named Irving Langmuir. And he's still, his name is still used extensively throughout the, uh, the industry. Langmuir probes, several things are named for him. There was also a tremendous amount of knowledge that's been added through the International Fusion Energy Program since the 1950s. <clears throat> and in everyday life, you'll see, see plasmas in lighting and fluorescent tubes, neon lights, Maybe people have seen the plasma ball. You see it in, in lightning strokes when the voltage across a, a neutral gas gets high enough, it arcs through, the plasma effectively forms and shorts out at the, the voltage with lightning. You see it with welders and cutters. You see it in, um, well, let me, I'll get to this over here in a minute, but you also see it in the auroras when, uh, when solar plasma, plasma coming from the sun, gets trapped by the uh, Earth's magnetic field. You see it around the surface of the sun. And you see it in electric propulsion systems like hall thrusters and Vasmere engines. So how do we make this plasma? We start off, I said, you know, or remind you that we were talking about adding heat to, the, to make it hotter and hotter to make plasma. The, the way to do this is the heat free electrons, or at least that's the way we do this for, uh, for Vasmere engines and other hall thrusters and, and also ion engines, is through electron impact ionization. So we start with an atom over here. It's initially fully, uh, fully neutral, the, it has a neutral, uh, uh, a cloud of electrons that make the whole system neutral with a positive nucleus. And you have a hot free electron that comes crashing into this cloud of electrons. That, that crash causes one of these electrons to get kicked out of its, its electron shell here and become free. And the original one that crashed in goes on. It loses some energy to kick this one out, but it's still free. So now I have an extra free electron. If I can, and, and what's left over of the atom is a positively charged ion. So if I continue to heat these free electrons, this will eventually lead to a cascade of ionization, and eventually that will become plasma once you get enough, enough of these free electrons and ions together. Okay, another very important thing about plasmas is that they ring, and in fact, almost everything rings. Every solid, er everything that you touch has certain natural uh, frequencies that they, that they oscillate at. So if you thump a lump of jello, uh, you'll get a resonant mode at what I'm calling the jiggle frequency. I don't know if that's a trademark problem or not, but, um, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that at Thanksgiving dinner, but it is interesting to thump jello. <laughs> um, if you strike a, be a bell, for instance, you get a resonant mode at an audio frequency. So, so jello is doing just a few cycles per second. We call those hertz. Uh, the bells are, are ringing at, at audio frequencies, kilohertz. And if you have a simple plasma, like in this, uh, in this uh, just arc welder discharge, you'll, uh, without any magnetic field, you'll have a resonant mode at what's called the plasma frequency. And those are typically in the gigahertz range, like for computers or cell phones, that's the type of frequency range that they, they ring at naturally. So these kinds of plasmas are, are very interesting, but they're pretty boring. So what you need to do is hit the button, right? There we go. 
we need to add a magnetic field to it. And when you add a magnetic field, voila, you now have almost something analogous to a musical instrument with, with plasmas. You can play these things like a fiddle. So the first thing that happens when you add the magnetic field is the ions and the electrons begin to spiral around this magnetic field. And if these blue lines are the magnetic field, the spiraling motion allows you to protect other surfaces. It allows you to build something like a magnetic bottle out of these field lines, we call them. And the plasma will tend to stream along those field lines. The other interesting thing having to do with the fiddle is that a whole rich new set of, of natural oscillations occur. So, so now we have a whole bunch of, of new modes that, that when I pluck this plasma, it's going to ring at different frequencies. And those frequencies are near the radial frequencies, at least the ones that we're interested in for Vasimir. So here I have a picture of a, of a simulation that we did way back in 2007 of some of our earlier Vasimir sources in the VX100 experiment at, at our laboratory in Texas. And um, in fact, we were still at the, uh, at the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory location in, in NASA at that time, the Sunny Carter facility. But we made the plasma with FM radio. So FM radio comes in and excites this coupler. There's a little window across here that actually keeps the plasma side isolated from this side, which we keep it vacuum. If we get gas out on this side, we make plasma on both sides, which is not good. We want to make plasma in this region. These radio frequency waves, even though the, the towers that you see for radio antennas are, are as big as a building, when you actually have a plasma, it has very special properties. These natural resonant modes become very short wavelength. They match to this coupler. You drive your power in much like you do heat your food in a microwave oven, and you can heat this gas and ionize virtually all of it by the time it leaves this thing. So the magnetic axis, you can see the field lines are tailoring along through here and flowing downstream. So plasma is born here, gas comes in here, uh, gets ionized in this chamber, and exits out through the booster section, which I'll show you a little bit more in a minute. Now once the plasma gets into this booster section, we heat that then with AM radio uh, frequencies, which are lower frequencies than, than the FM radio band. And we do that because we want to interact with these ions. The ions in our system, for instance, in argon, imagine uh, an electron is a ping pong ball, an ion is like a bowling ball, very, very massive and heavy compared to these electrons. So we want to put our power in these big, massive bowling balls and get them rolling in the right direction without touching anything. <laughs> and that's what we do in Vasimir in the booster section. So the bottom line here is the Vasimir engine makes and heats the plasma using natural resonant modes of magnetized plasma. Th this is a key difference between us and other types of things because we use natural resonant modes. So what does the plasma source look like? Or I'm going to sort of assemble a, a, a cartoon Vasimir engine here for you. So the plasma source starts with just neutral, a neutral gas injection port. So we just pull propellant out of a tank by whatever mechanism you want to do it. Inject it here as a gas. We take DC power from the solar arrays, and we, we run that through basically just an FM broadcast radio uh, technology. It's the same sort of thing that you use for um, converting uh, your DC power to AC power in your car these days. It's just extended up to radio frequency. And it's commercially available and, and, and very cheap and very efficient. Uh, that power then comes in and hooks up to this coupler right here, where we basically then drive the, the power into the plasma, much like I was saying, you heat your food in a microwave oven. There's also, you can see this, this magnetic choke in this region. This section here keeps excess gas that the plasma doesn't quite all get ionized. It bounces it back into the plasma and forces it to be recirculated in here so that by the time you get to this region, it's nearly 100% plasma. You don't want any extra gas floating around in here when you get down to this region. You want it to be almost all plasma. This was all shown to be very efficient in our experiments early on, way back in 2007 where we reached ADEV, I won't go into details about what ADEV are, but that's, the sort of, that's, that's a very efficient plasma source uh, to extract an electron-ion pair. We pull the electrons and the ions out together in the system. Okay, the plasma booster section, that's what happens, what we do with the plasma. After we've made the plasma in this section and get it run through here, we run it through this AM radio booster section. And again, we take DC power from our solar rays, run it into the RF generators, these are just radios, AM radio type systems, run that into here and spin up the ions. So this is where most of the power for the, um, for the rocket comes from. I should also remark, we're using superconducting magnets in this region because here we have plasma temperatures that are tens of, kil or tens of degrees C. We get into this region, we have plasma temperatures that are a million degrees C. In this region, you do not want anything touching. Don't ask me how we know that, we've touched and it does hurt. So, 
So you pull the, you pull the magnetic bottle out and, and leave a separation in this region. So in this process, then you can heat up this plasma until it, it gains all this energy here, and it's still spinning around the magnetic field, and it will provide most of the jet power. So now we go into the last main section of the rocket, which is the magnetic nozzle. So there's a property of magnetic fields such that when, when a magnetic field expands gently, these bowling balls that are spiraling around the magnetic field can, can convert the energy that they have that's perpendicular to that magnetic field into a directed parallel energy down, down the path. You want to do that gradually because if you do it too rapidly, they'll lose track of where they are. Uh, and so we do that expansion through the last little section here. The magnets are tailored to allow this to happen so that you can convert about 90% of the energy that you pumped into the plasma through this section here can then be converted into a directed jet, and that's what's going to make the, the rocket go. Uh, then the last detail, okay, now that we've expanded out, what, what, gets it, what gets it off of the magnetic field? And again, it's because these giant bowling ball things, as they're going around the magnetic field, now they're going down this axis, and the magnetic field is peeling off away from them. When they try to go around, they can't find the magnetic field line that they were on before, and they just keep right on going. So this is a natural detachment. You can see this sort of thing in astrophysics, uh, astrophysical jets. And uh, it, it turns, uh, you know, basically allows the magnetic field from the superconductor re to return back to the rocket without having to have any interaction more with the plasma. There's one other thing that we have to add to this whole system to make it a complete rocket system, and that's thermal control. Even though these radios are very, very efficient, only a few percent of our power is lost in this conversion process from DC power to RF power, you still have to take care of that. If you're talking about a 100 kilowatt system, 2% is 2 kilowatts. So that has to be taken off and radiated through uh, regular radiators. We also run little small refrigerators about this big. They, they use a few hundred watts to keep the magnets cold. So we keep the magnets well insulated back in this region from this hot plasma and the magnetic field is also insulating them. And uh, you have to reject the waste heat from that. That goes out through the same system as the, as the radio uh, waste heat. The big loss of heat here is about 20% of your power is lost in this section because when you knock these electrons off of the atoms, you, you don't always get them knocked off the first time. So you, you'll excite a few other electrons and they'll fall back in their shell and they'll, they'll emit mostly ultraviolet light for the types of species that we use and a lot of visible light, and that goes and runs into your ceramic, your ceramic windows that we're using to, to, to uh, isolate the plasma from the radio waves. And, and you have to take that heat out of the system. So about 20% of your input power from your DC power will have to be taken out through this system. 20% is getting to be a lot, so we run this out on a high temperature system. We run this out at about 250C, so that the radiator that radiates to space doesn't have to be very big. Any power in space that you waste, you have to radiate it through a radiator. There's no river or anything you can dump your power into when, you, when you're wrong. So that's why we run this at high temperature. And that, that completes a, a, the full system. So another thing about this system that's a little bit different from other ones is that a lot of systems, we, we call them nonlinear. The different subsystems will interplay with each other. Vasimir is a little bit unique in that it has somewhat complicated subsystems but they're all very weakly coupled. So that our magnet, we run a superconducting magnet now, you just set it, pretty much forget it. The plasma doesn't really do anything to it, and it doesn't do anything other than what it's supposed to do to the plasma. The radio waves, you can tune them all electronically, and so in the end, you have really no moving parts, and the system is, is very loosely coupled together and works together very naturally. So you don't have to fight any kind of nonlinear things, because again, we're using natural re resonant modes for the plasma. This is a picture of our test uh, facility that we have in, or our test engine that we have in uh, our vacuum chamber. So you can see the, the vacuum chamber around here. We have a, a vacuum chamber wall here. This is called our VX200 experiment. This is just an experimental test structure that sort of integrates all these things. You can kind of see right in here a little bit of the magnet, uh, the outer structure for the magnet, part of our insulation for the magnet. So the rocket is actually a fairly small thing inside the structure. But our, our, we have to test it, and so this is how we're rolling it in. You can also see that we have these plastic panels here, and we did that because with a rocket this big, you're, you're expelling, uh, from electric propulsion standards, you're expelling a lot of gas, and you have to maintain a pretty good vacuum on this side of the, of the system. Otherwise, you'll make plasma outside the rocket instead of inside. 
But the unique thing about a Vasmir engine is that this whole system is sealed throughout so that the, um, you have to seal the, the, the gas from getting out to the RF inside those cylindrical tubes that I showed you earlier. And you can extend that seal right on out to the wall of the vacuum chamber, which is what we did uh, in our experiments starting in 2008 or not, 2009, I guess, in this system. And um, by doing that, you can pump on the far side of this system, you pump all the gas that's going through the rocket separately from this region. This region sees a very low gas load and you can pump it at low cost and keep the pressure low enough here so that you don't short out your engine and you can provide good space-like conditions on this side without having to pump the whole chamber. This chamber is 150 cubic meters. Okay, and here's a, uh, I think Brangan showed this yesterday, but here's a shot on the other side of the wall as the plasma comes out. You can see we have a test stand in here that's taking measurements and seeing how hard the plasma is pushing on it. Also, you'll see when it turns off that, that these items get hot. You can see the color slowly changing back here, and that's because gas is building up in this region faster than we can pump it out. We need to improve our pumps in order to, to run much longer. Nevertheless, the plasma doesn't really care. You can tell from the temperature here that we're getting a lot of power downstream. Uh, as I said, about 20% of our power we have to reject through the heat system. About 80% of the power comes out through the plasma, and it's why these things get so hot. Those, those little wiggling, waving things are actually measuring the, the, the force of the plasma blowing in the plasma breeze. And if you leave them in there for very many shots like this, they'll start to fall off. They, it destroyed, they're made out of ceramic and, and carbon, but they, they will still be destroyed. So anyway, this, this is how the system works, and this is why we ran this system for 10,000 short shots. In one second, we can get all the physics data we need from the plasma and then turn off the system and let the vacuum pumps catch up. So that's why we've done what we've done so far. Okay, so now on to how you apply this as a, um, as a, a space, in-space propulsion system. <clears throat> uh, Vasimir engines, because of their, their natural properties, are scalable. You can take a single magnet and continue to just pile more and more power through it until you hit the thermal limits, and you don't have to really worry about any, changing anything else in the system. So, you can run power levels all the way from tens of kilowatts, and if you can have the thermal system to handle it up to megawatts in a single one of these thruster cores. This is, this is uh, 10 times better than what you can do through Hall thrusters. Hall thruster powers, to make them go up, you have to make the whole system get bigger. And you have to add, their power uh, processing units are heavier. They're, they're beautiful, don't, let, don't get me wrong, Hall thrusters are beautiful in the range where they operate. Uh, but if you try to go to high power, this system is a much better way to go. Vasimir also, because they're loosely coupled, allows you to, to throttle your power over a broad range. Uh, it, they're very efficient. They convert, actually the 70%, about 80% of the power goes out as plasma, and about 90% of that 80% is actually going in the right direction. We call that jet power, which is the power that you really want for thrust. <clears throat> and so about 70% of the input solar power can be converted to jet power. Uh, our designs were uh, all done prior to actually building these systems, both for the VX100 and VX200, and our, we use physics-based modeling. Those models were very well verified and slightly refined. There's a few things where we learn and, and, and fix our models, but that's how we do our design for our rockets. We've been doing this for six or seven, eight, nine, actually 10 years. I was doing some of this way back in Oak Ridge before I joined Ad Astra uh, as part of a deal with NASA. So the variable jet velocities, you can also get variable jet velocities at constant input power without changing the efficiency. That's kind of nice for flexibility and, and different types of missions. Broadening your launch window, you can change, if you miss your launch window by um, or the exact perfect spot, by a little bit you can adjust your ISP and still make up for it. So you have a lot better launch windows. And by changing the different kinds of gases that you might use, maybe not in a single rocket, but over depending on what mission you wanted to run, you can run your exhaust velocities all the way from 15 kilometers per second. Remember, orbital velocity is eight kilometers per second. Up to more than 300, or more than 100 kilometers per second, even 300 kilometers per second if you want to use hydrogen. Uh, and so you can get the propellant going out the back end of the rocket. You can get it going very fast. So if you have a system where you're going a long distance and you're able to just put the pedal to the metal and leave it down for halfway till you get to Mars, then you turn the system around and leave the pedal down and decelerate. That's how you get high speeds out of these systems. And you can get speeds approaching you know, 10 times what you can get from a chemical system. There we go. 
So this, this reiterates where we actually fit in the, rest, in the electric propulsion family. So there are ion engines and hall thrusters down here below 10 or 20 kilowatts. They're, they operate the, in this regime very nicely. They're very efficient, but it's hard to make them scale up to higher power levels without just stacking more and more of them on. The Vasmir system runs very effectively up here in these power levels above 30 to, to 100 kilowatts and even higher. So I believe that this can be extended up to megawatts in a single thruster system. You'll probably want to run these in pairs or maybe four sets of four uh, for redundancy, for dipole cancellation, for lots of other reasons. But that this puts you into megawatt class systems, which is the very high power systems that you want. But it also runs back down here. Solar power can, can provide these power levels fairly efficiently, so it's very good for solar power too. Uh, the technology uh, has real advantages over haul when your jet power, which doesn't include all your conversion efficiencies, amounts to about 30 kilowatts. This is what really you do your mission with, is jet power. And you basically have lower mass. So if you're using haul thrusters and you try to go up in power, eventually you saturate. And, and somewhere in this vicinity, you have to have, um, you just have to add more and more engines. You can't make more power go through the same engine. A Vasmer engine is heavier when you're at low powers because you have a magnet that's difficult to make smaller, but as you add and put more power through it, you saturate at a much, much uh, higher power level than you do with a Hall thruster. Um, they're also more, more efficient because <clears throat> they, they use a little bit more uh, of the solar power that you have available to them to actually get it into the jet. Uh, their efficiency is maintained over this wide power range, so you have some flexibility. Uh, they are also able to go to higher specific impulse. We typically run at, um, at 50 kilometers per second for our uh, exhaust for, um, for uh, argon plasmas, uh, 5,000 seconds ISP, whereas the chemical rockets are more like 400 seconds ISP. Uh, and we have extensive performance data. So VX200 has done almost all the physics data that we really want to do. We're into engineering and thermal management right now. So all of our systems are what we would call technical readiness level five, except for the thermal management system. And the only reason that it's still at four is because we haven't tested it. We're now manufacturing the parts that we need to go ahead and complete those tests. Those tests will be pretty expensive to do because we have to run this vacuum system for a long time. Facility costs are high. So in summary, faster exhaust velocity from a plasma rocket uh, gives you the necessary momentum using much less propellant, and that can be used in two ways. Either you can take a lot more cargo slowly, or you can actually continue, if you have a long distance to go, continue to just keep accelerating and use that propellant to get very high velocity. So you can go faster or take more and, and sort of anywhere in between. It uses plasma, which consists of a loosely coupled hot soup or, or um, jello version of ions and electrons, and they behave collectively. So it's important to remember that plasma still glues itself together uh, and holds itself together in a collective manner. We use magnetized plasma. Adding the magnetic field allows you to tailor the, the system so it can follow through the, the rest of the structure that holds the rocket together and protect those material surfaces. It also adds this beautiful, to me, beautiful music of rich, rich natural modes in the radio frequency range that you can uh, apply and, and exploit to get the plasma to do what you want it to do. Vasmir uses these, these natural modes to accelerate, both create the, the plasma with FM radio and accelerate it with AM radio or in that vicinity. And it does it without having to separate the ions electrons like through an arc and recombining them what, like you do in other types of systems. The engines have better performance than other propulsion if you're above about 50 kilowatts. So we're, we're now entering the 40 to 50 kilowatt solar power range with technology right now. So we're starting to enter the range where all the rest of the pieces needed to support Vasmer exist. And some, many, most of them have even flown. Uh, and we have more than 10 times the power density. We can pack more than 10 times as much power through a unit area than you can with conventional or more conventional electric propulsion systems. That's all I really have. I'm probably pretty close to the end of my time. I've got more information. Here's a picture of some of our units. Here's our superconducting <laughs> magnet. Here's some high temperature superconducting magnet tests we've been done. These cryo coolers you saw in the glacier measurement or glacier experiments that Greg was just showing the, about the, uh, the, the coolers that they had there. They use a variant of this same cooler run for many, many years. They're used for oxygen generators too uh, in, on the ground. 
uh, and this is just more our status. I better go. There's more background, uh, other kinds of uh, references, peer-reviewed journal articles, and various other things, and that's all I have.